And if there's one thing I'll say to us younger ones, come to church while you can. Yes. Amen. Because, you know, you take the fellowship and everything for granted. Yes. But when you can't come, yes. that's yes. when you really realize how yes. wonderful it's yes. been. Yes. So it is good to see you and other brothers and sisters yes. and our visitors from Jamaica. May God bless you as we spend these moments sharing the word of God. Please turn to John 6. Um, in John 6 verse 31 to 41, and read from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. John 6 verse 31 to 41. Jesus said to the Jews, you know, if you feed people, they always gather around you. And so Jesus had people following him for all kinds of reasons. After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scripture says, Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God, who sent me not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see His Son and believes in Him shall should have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. I am the bread of life. Let us pray. Father, speak to our own hearts now. In your word. Amen. Amen. <coughs> you know not what spirit you are of. Experience teaches us that we become like the God we worship. If we love and worship a merciful, kind, and compassionate God, we will emulate his character and be kind and compassionate people <coughs> ourselves. If we worship a harsh and brutal God, we would be like that. Just yesterday I was listening to the news and um, a couple of weeks ago the mayor of Mogadishu he was a young man who lived in Canada who went back home to try and do some good in his own country, Somalia. The mayor of Mogadishu was blown to death. Now, he was blown to death by two women. One was blind, one was seen. But there were two women who worked in his office. Because they belong to Al Shabaab who hates anybody who doesn't see the world in their way. Yeah. And so they left and they went and, uh, and they were, um, they put on their suicide vest mm -hmm. and they came and they blew him up and uh, several other people in their office to death. <laughs> now, the view I'd like us to keep in mind is that their view is that anybody who doesn't see the world like you do is enemy. And if you kill them, you are doing God a favor. Yeah. Now Jesus himself said that the day is going to come when people will kill you and think that they are doing God a service. Yeah. Now the issue is, what is your God like? You see, in the Old Testament, we see the worship of, worshippers of Baal. Um, 
conducting their worship service in various ways. Baal was the god of fertility. And, and therefore, um, the sexual act was venerated, and the worship of Baal and Ashtoreth involved sexual orgies and all kinds of things, not in private, in the church. So, so you went to church to worship God, and part of your worship was to choose a nice little damsel or a nice handsome young man and have your way with them. The God you worship determines how you behave. And, and so um, one of the things they did was that we, we read about people passing their children through the fire, which means that they offer their children as sacrifices to God. Now, now imagine, Brother Carey, you would give your firstborn son as a, as a gift to God. Now, what greater gift could you give to God? You know, than give your own flesh. But that is not a requirement from God. And God strictly forbade it. In today's world, we see all of that carry on because men have abandoned God, invented gods of their own devising mm -hmm. and do what they do. Mm -hmm. As contemporary Christians, we have left that kind of behavior behind, though in the Middle Ages we know the Catholic Church killed some 40 million or so Christians um, who did not see the world as they did. But as we approach the Lord's table today, we need to ask the question, what kind of God? Because for some people, they say, God must be very bloodthirsty because he wanted all those animal sacrifices and all those things. So God is a bloodthirsty um, God. But as we approach the Lord's table today, we remember, the Bible says, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So, so what was all this blood sacrifice about? It was reminding the sinner that sin pays a consequence. And the Bible says that the blood, the life is in the blood. So when that animal was killed, that life was taken. When that blood was poured out, it was a sign to say that the life has been given. And it was teaching them that though I deserve to die, I bring a kid or a lamb, and I offer that kid or lamb in place of me. It was teaching them that God had a substitute who would die and pay the penalty for the sins of the whole world. And so John the Baptist by the Jordan River saw him coming and John the Baptist said in John 1 29, Behold the Lamb of God. Look! There he is! He is the Lamb of God. The one that takes away the sins of the whole world. And he was saying all the lambs all the turtle doves, all the animal sacrifice in all the ages past pointed to him. He is God's true lamb. In his death, by his own sacrifice, God deals with the problem of sin. All we like sheep have gone. We have turned everyone to his own way. And what has God done? The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Therefore, in the death of Jesus Christ, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the sins of all humanity, every sin that has ever been committed, every sin that will ever be committed, has been placed upon him. And as a consequence of that amazing act of God, sinners now have freedom from sin. Sinners now have freedom from death and destruction. For the wages of sin 
is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. When Jesus turned away, was turned away by a Samaritan village, the disciples in righteous indignation asked permission to call down fire from heaven upon them as Elijah did. But Luke recorded the response of Jesus in these words. In, in Luke 9 verse 55, Jesus said, Jesus turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. They wanted to bring judgment. But Jesus was saying, that's not what I am like. My kingdom is not motivated by that kind of spirit. Scripture reveals that in John 1 verse 10, that he came unto his own and his own received him not. But he loved them to the uttermost, dying to redeem man and showing the full extent of his love. Eating at the Lord's table is a public sign of our acknowledgement that we are sinners and it is an indication of our commitment to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. In John 13, verse 1, we are told it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that an hour had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Verse 2, the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? The kind of God you believe in and worship determines the kind of person you are. Jesus kneels down and washed their feet. Jesus knew that within an hour or two, they would betray him. Jesus knew that within an hour or two, they would all run away from him. Jesus knew that in an hour or two, Peter would say, I do not know the man. And to prove he didn't know him, he would swear and curse and carry on sadly. And yet Jesus knowing their heart, got up from table, and he washed their feet. Not only did he wash their feet, but he broke the bread and gave them wine to drink. Now, Brother Clarence, if, 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 if it was me, I would shame Judas so much that he would never show his face in, in Jerusalem again. But Jesus didn't shame him. No. If I was Jesus, when I was done with Peter, after Peter saying, Though all men forsake you, I will not forsake you. But Jesus knew their heart. Jesus washed their feet. Jesus gave them bread and wine. It shows us the kind of God we are serving. As Jesus was arrested by the high priest, Peter pulled out his sword and went to chop off the servant's head. Let me tell you, he was not, head, he was not going for the ear. He was going for the neck. And the poor young man moved just in time. Jesus said, put away your sword. You know not what kingdom, what spirit you are of. And he picked up the ear and put it back on. And I'm telling you, if he had got the head, Jesus would have taken up that head and put it back on. And put it back on. Do you know what spirit is motivating you? As we daily examine our own relationships, we must ask ourselves honestly, what spirit motivates us? 
Is it the spirit of Christ or Antichrist? In our relationships in the domestic realm, how we treat our wives and husbands, brothers and sisters, parents, which spirit is motivating you? Why did Jesus do all this? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We believe in his word. We accept his divine provision of eternal life. Yes, this is the amazing truth. Paul says in Romans 10 that God justifies the ungodly. God treats the ungodly as if he were righteous. And that is the reason why you can come to the table of oration. Because God treats you, a sinner, as if you were, on, you were righteous. The only, that's the only way I can have hope of looking in his face at the judgment seat. Because God, in Jesus Christ, treats the ungodly yeah. as if you were righteous. Mm -hmm. Because if we put our faith and trust in God, he assumes the guilt that is mine, and he gives me the righteousness that is his. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the same shall be saved. As we consider that Thursday night when Jesus was betrayed, we remember the meaning he gave to that last Passover meal. We cannot view this supper in a casual way when we consider the events of that night. The communion gains deeper meaning when we remember that we too were there that night. They say, oh, no, no, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> the old gospel song says, were you there yeah. when they crucified my Lord? When they abandoned him and fled? When Peter denied him, saying, I know not the man? Yes, we were there in Judas, the schemer and the betrayer who sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Many of us are serving, are selling Jesus for money, for a few moments of stolen pleasure. Many of us are selling Christ for material things. Yet when the moment of testing comes, many of us are first to declare, I know not the man. I was there in all the other disciples who followed him afar off, far for, for others, for other than unselfish reasons, but run away when the going gets tough. We were there among the cross, among the crowd that shouted, crucify him, crucify him. We all were there at various times in all that. Do you deny it? Hebrews 10, 26 tells us that if we deny Christ and put him to public shame, what are we doing? We are crucifying him afresh. When we deny Christ and put him to public shame, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, is no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses, his Lord, died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy of who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common sin and insulted the spirit of grace. The Lord's Supper is made more memorable through anticipation. When you go on holiday and leave your wife, if you leave your husband, if you ever do that, you have a good time, but you can't wait to go back home. Why? Because you love him, because you're bonded to him. In the same way, if you love Jesus and have a relationship with him, though you might enjoy life down here, you can't wait. You can't wait for that reunion when you will see him face to face, when you will be one with him forever and ever. The memory of deeply intimate relationships with him cannot bear 
you cannot bear to be away from him. The memory of numerous uplifting experiences at the communion table makes us look forward to the day when we shall break bread and take the cup together in our Father's kingdom. The most important act we can do to please God is to believe in His Son. The works of God is to believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. Christ is the bread of life. The daily bread was the staple food. You see, we have all kinds of things, but in Palestine, every day they ate bread made from wheat or barley or rye or that sort of thing. I don't think they had yam and sweet potatoes and that sort of thing. So, 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 so bread was their staple food. And if they didn't eat bread, they would starve to death. So, so the, the idea here is just like how you eat bread every day to live. So if you're going to live eternally and have a relationship with Christ, you must have him as that bread of life in your life every day. Yes, yes, Lord. Jesus said, this is my body which was broken for you. This cup represents my blood, my life. In drinking the wine, we seal the covenant, affirming the genuine permanence of what, of the relationship that we have with him and what he has done for us. Where, whenever we eat the emblems, we are in a deeply spiritual way, taking into ourselves through faith, spiritual energy and life, enabling us to live the new life of victory in Jesus Christ. We are reaffirming our commitment to the covenant that we are no longer rebels following the way of sin, but loyal sons and daughters having full acceptance with our Heavenly Father. The Lord's Supper is a dramatic representation of the way Christ paid the penalty for our guilt as rebels and also guaranteeing our acceptance with God and our surety of eternal life. The Lord's Supper is made more memorable through our involvement in the world. When we walk with Christ and take some of the blows that he took, we find it easier to identify with him, especially as we reflect on the night he initiated the Lord's Supper. Remember his new betrayal by his nearest and dearest. In the Acts 11.22, the last clause says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And if you are not suffering in any way, then it means that something is wrong. Because the devil must be so happy with you, where he has you, and he's just leaving you there, rocking you like a baby, saying, stay there, stay there, you're all right, you're right where I have you. But if you are following God and living for him, he is going to fight you. He's going to make your life hell. So all that will lead God in Christ Jesus will suffer. Now the communion service will bond us closer to the Lord, affirming to our consciences that we truly belong to Him. We must remember that God before whom we bow is our Creator, Redeemer, and our Sovereign Lord. Whenever or whatever we give a higher priority to obedience to Him becomes our God, becomes an idol. In 1 Corinthians 10, Verse 14 to 22. In 1 Corinthians 10, 14 to 22, as I wrap it up, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14 to 22, listen to what Paul said here. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. Judge for yourselves what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. Observe Israel after the flesh. Are not those who eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What am I saying then? 
that an idol is anything, or what is offered to idols is anything, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? <coughs> Where am I going with this text? It is saying that when the Gentiles offered their sacrifice, they were offering it to demons. If we say we belong to Christ, and we are living in a way that is inconsistent with him and his word and his will. And let it be clear that what we offer to God is not to him. And when we offer our prayers, they won't go higher than the ceiling. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot sit on the fence. You cannot play games with God. <laughs> if my wife sleeps in my bed and then she goes on the road and sleeps in somebody else's bed, it is not going to work. In the same way, if you come and eat at the Lord's table and get up and go and eat at somebody else's table, it is not going to work. The Lord says that it is eating at demons' tables. Therefore, we must be consistent. We must be sincere. We must follow God all the way. The demons of pride and division must be recognized as such and rebuked. The demons of worldliness and compromise should have no power over us. Because Jesus is Lord, Lord of your life, Lord of all you and I are. The demons of fear and doubt must be driven out by the risen Christ. Christ must be all in all. For the Lord's Supper to be memorable, there must be self-examination. 1 Corinthians 11 says, let a man so examine himself. Standing before God's full-length mirror, we become aware of every flaw in our character. We must, without hesitation, see ourselves as God sees us. This vision of ourselves will often be painful and humiliating. And this is what God wants us to see. He wants us to be uncomfortable in seeing our selfishness, our rebellion against Him, our immorality, and our resistance to His will. And when we see ourselves as He sees us, we will want to get on our knees and confess all our sins and ask Him to forgive and transform us. Then having tasted the joy of divine forgiveness and being made certain of our unconditional acceptance by Him, we can approach the Lord's table with joy and confidence. While we believe that the bread and grape juice remains just bread and grape juice, unlike what some other people teach, we will also believe that in receiving them by faith, we receive Christ in a new way in our lives. The Holy Spirit will heighten our awareness of God's presence and of all His call to us to bear our crosses with honor and to live for Him in a new way. At the communion table, we are experiencing the Lord's presence, the Lord's power and the Lord's purpose in a deeper and new way. From His table, we will look back at the cross and his amazing sacrifice. And we will look forward to that great wedding banquet in the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you don't show the Lord's death till he comes. Let us eat and drink. Jesus says, come and dine. Let us eat and drink, affirming we are his. Affirming that we will go forth to live for Him and let His light shine through us. Affirming that one day soon, by His grace, we will eat and drink with Him in that heavenly land. Amen. 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 Amen.